Welcome back to Fair and Friends Friday. I'm Karen Waltek, the horticulturist for the Beatrix Farron Garden Association in Hyde Park, New York. Today I took a field trip 10 minutes south of Hyde Park down to Poughkeepsie, New York to the Locust Grove Estate and I was lucky enough to get a short tour with the Locust Grove Estate gardener Claire Davis. She took some time to show us a couple of the really special gardens that are here on site and I also wanted to let you know that they're free and open to the public right now. So please check out their website and plan your visit. Let's go see what Claire's gonna show us at the Locust Grove Estate. Hi, I'm Claire. I am the gardener here at Locust Grove. We are located in Poughkeepsie. Um, we were historically a private estate. We're now a public garden. We are open currently 10 to five, um, we're free uh, and we're open every weekday. Um, we are here in the cutting garden. Um, we grow a lot of historic plants, um, historic varieties of plants. Um, many of these were originally grown in sort of the late 1800s to the early 1900s um, by the young family who lived in this house. Um, we still have really fun and great records of things that were originally planted here. Um, so these are all snapdragons. It's sort of a mix. They are older varieties, um, mostly from between like 1900 and 1940. Um, the really wonderful thing about these sort of more old fashioned ones is that they're fragrant. Um, and so they smell a little bit like um, like grape flavored candy to me um, and that effect is really lovely in here. Um, the youngs seemed to really really love like super fluffy pink and white plants and so those are we try to represent those well here we have a lot of those um, and if you ever take a tour of the house if you see the dishes those are or like the decor things are you know there's a lot of fluffy pink and white flowers in there as well um, and so I think that's a really fun echo um, a thing that I think is interesting and fun to talk about in here is that um, Mrs. Young Martha Young called this the English garden um, we're not a hundred percent sure why um, but we think it's partly because you know many of these plants are strongly associated with English cutting gardens however I don't none of them are actually native to England um, many of them are from drier regions of the world um, snapdragons are for sure um, and sweet Williams down here also really long association with English cottage gardens. Um, they, the first mention of them in England is somewhere, in, I think in the mid 1500s in John Gerard's Herbal. Um, they're native to Southern Europe. Um, they want a dry situation. Um, and often people will plant these as annuals or biennials. Um, we don't add any compost in here we don't irrigate them um, sort of anecdotally um, I have found that these are longer lasting plants without the addition of compost and extra water um, and it seems to also do away with some of the like crown rot and leaf spot issues that these can be prone to this these are dahlias and cyanoglossum this is sort of having this transitional sort of like growing your hair out moment. Um, these, this cyanoglossum was sort of in full flower, was sort of a really lovely just row of blue um, about a week or two weeks ago. Um, and we planted dahlias underneath it. Um, and we did that partly to have like a spring layer of flowers. Again, this is a historic annual for us. Um, this is something that I plant in mid-March. It's super, super hardy um, and it flowers early. Um, we also have a really fierce flock of groundhogs. Um, and in years past, you know, sort of no amount of stinky 
deer and groundhog preventing sprays was keeping the groundhogs like away from these dahlias. Um, but these cyanoglossums tend to sort of really spread out over the dahlias and have done a pretty good job of protecting them this year. So we both get these um, lovely and super prolific blue flowers. These are like a lovely cut flower. Um, and then, you know, these minimally nibbled dahlias um, coming through those. Um, and some of our earliest varieties usually start to flower like mid to late July, um, probably a bit later this year. These are delphinium, um, and this is Redbeckia or Gloriosa daisy, is sort of the old fashioned name. And this is another space where, you know, we do our best to plant sort of groundhog and deer resistant plants that are also historic varieties. Um, but we also layer things so that there's kind of always something coming and going but in some cases these plants like help protect the smaller ones and prevent them from getting eaten so delphinium are like fairly resistant um, as are redbeckia um, but as some of these bushier plants um, open up because we do actively use this as a cutting garden and sort of once you cut that central stem out um, They become much bushier. They also sort of protect like the less deer resistant plant, which I Plant under the bushier thing um, So these are both things that would have been in this garden in the early 1900s um, dill probably isn't. Um, this is sort of something that we're using temporarily, but it has done a pretty good job of deterring creatures um, just because it's got a really strong scent. And again, like once you take the central stem out, um, it sort of makes a thicket, um, which is hard for creatures to crawl into. And right now um, it's protecting um, some really tiny cosmos seedlings, um, a cosmos mix, which hopefully that will continue to work and we'll have cosmos, you know, early September um, that, you know, will go into early November if we don't get a frost. So this is a bed that, um, you know, in the early 1900s would have been divided up in a way that's pretty similar to our cutting beds where there were just sort of blocks of single flowers, many of them perennial. Um, but what we've done with this area is these are a lot of the historic perennials who have like a really beautiful moment of flowering and then just look like terrible for the rest of the season. Um, and so we've planted it in sort of more of like a mixed bordery fashion so that we can get all these historic plants in here but rather than having, say, like a block of bearded irises that's so beautiful for like two to three weeks and then, you know, often looks like really, really shabby by the end of the summer, we sort of tuck them in here um, and let other plants cover them up. Um, and so, yeah, it helps us get more historic plants in here. It's just like a really fun way to get to play with some of these historic plants. Um, there are a lot of really lovely natives in here. Um, you know, native plants have been used for a really, really long time in ornamental gardens. Um, some of the natives are this purple coneflower, um, Echinacea purpurea, this phlox, um, which is a variety, not the straight species. Um, this is Cabot Pink from Amazing Perennial Pleasures in Vermont. Um, Another fun thing that we get to do in here is grow straight species, which are the plants that would have been available at that time. So rather than, you know, a modern variety of this, we grow the straight um, Achillea philopendulina. Um, it is a whole lot taller and lankier than many, many um, modern cultivars, but it has tons to recommend it. It still blooms for a really long time. Um, I love this like very brassy yellow. Um, and another great thing about a lot of these plants is that they're very drought tolerant, um, which was a huge help this spring. Um, Salvia scleria um, is another one that, um, or clary sage um, is another one that 
you know, has really long lasting bracts. Um, so, you know, the, some of the purple that you see on there will last for a couple months. Um, and again, it's super drought tolerant. This is our veggie garden. Um, this is a working veggie garden. We maintain it with an amazing crew of volunteers. Um, and we work on here on Thursday mornings. Um, in the past and normally, um, we all split up the produce before volunteers head out. Because this year has been different, um, a lot of this produce has been going to Beacon Mutual Aid, um, who we really appreciate for you know taking this produce as it is, we're able to drop off big bundles, um, uh, a lot of greens, a lot of beets this spring, um, and that's been really helpful um, because one of the, the things that we miss when we don't have our volunteers here is um, the harvesting and that these plants um, need to be harvested to keep producing. Um, we also do a lot of successions in here. You can sort of see where you know, these beets are almost done, but we've got sort of another batch coming up. And so there's a lot always kind of coming and going in here. Um, we do grow a lot of the varieties that the youngs grew um, when they were here. This has been a kitchen garden in some way, shape or form for a really long time, um, but it was restored about 20 years ago um, and that was a big project and we're really happy to have this space to grow all these veggies. So the first thing you see when you enter through the visitor center are the gardens. We also have many acres of forest um, are part of this place. Um, we're always um, the trails are open as long as the grounds are open. They're free. Um, the trails are pretty gentle inclines dogs are welcome um, yeah many acres of beautiful lowland forest um, to explore I hope you enjoyed that short tour of the locust grove gardens with Claire as much as I did visitors are often asking us what other local attractions they can visit in the area when they come to the Beatrix Farron garden and we're so glad to have another beautiful public garden only minutes away from ours so we hope that when you visit us you'll consider visiting locust grove we we'll look forward to seeing you next week with another Fair and Friends Friday. And until then, have a good week.